let's open up with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we enter your courts with praise and thanksgiving. Lord, we thank you for choosing our pastor to shepherd this church. Thank you for helping him to walk in the counsel of the godly. May you continue strengthening him so that he can lead us to you, our true and living God. Lord, may he hide under your wings all the days of his life. And Lord, I pray that you would bless our praise and worship this morning. I just pray that everything that is said, everything that is sung here today will bring honor and glory and praise to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all stand and sing with us. Song 
could ever see. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Jesus, the name of all. church for a while, but during this study this week, um, God was really dealing with me about putting him first completely, and 
not allowing other things to crowd in and um, like idols, you know, because in First Kings, in this story about Elijah, it talks a lot about idols. And let me just read from First Kings 18 and just for a backstory, real quick, I'm not going to preach. The Israelites had just fallen away from God so deeply. Their king Ahab and his wife Jezebel had just let prophets of Baal, which was the name of their god with a little g, and he was the god of the sun and the rain and nature and all this stuff. But they had just completely abandoned God and the worship of the one true God. So this is where we are in the story, and Elijah had had enough. And so he went to in front of all the people of Israel, and he laid down the gauntlet and said, this is the day. There's going to be no more of this. You're going to choose. So that's where we are. So um, in verse 20, it says, So Ahab summoned all the people of Israel and the prophets to Mount Carmel. Then Elijah stood in front of them and said, How much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people were completely silent. Man, that's sad, isn't it? That those were God's people, and yet they remained silent. Um, they were too afraid to choose God because they were so afraid of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. And because they were hobbling, they, they still worshiped God a little bit. But they still, but they also worshipped Baal and all these other gods, all these other idols. Y'all can put your idol, because we all have them, in place of that word Baal. And they were wobbling. And the thought came to me this morning um, that they were hobbling, and that was crippling them. They were crippled because they had abandoned God as the one true God. And when we abandon God as our one true God and don't put him first and don't make him our priority, we are crippled. And I was thinking about this song, and the line says, I will exalt. The first, the first little um, verse says, your presence is all I need. It's all I want. It's all I seek. And let that be your heart's cry this morning. And if it's not, while we're singing, just really think about those words and what they mean, and turn to that one true God.
this morning. Let that be our declaration, that there is no one like you, God. And Lord Jesus, we want you to be not just our Savior, but our Lord, the Lord over our life. And we thank you, Jesus, for your presence here today. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. good this morning? All right. We're in the house of the Lord, and that's one good thing, right? Amen. All right. Uh, does anybody have any prayer requests this morning? I have some here. I'll get done with y'all's if y'all have any. Anybody have any prayer requests? Eric Johnson's dad, Mr. Henry Johnson, I understand that he may have had a, maybe a heart attack and a stroke. Uh, must have been the second half of the week. I don't know exactly what day, but uh, he's, he's doing fairly well, but he's good. He does have some problems, which they hope he can overcome, but we sure need to hold him up in prayer. Uh, the Thompson family, uh, one of Brother Rick's schoolmates, I believe, they lost their son. We need to remember them. We need to remember Frank and Lisa Weaver. We wish they were here with us today. Lord, bring them back soon and get them well. A uh, young lady named Elaine Williams had a heart attack yesterday. Um, I'm kind of an old family friend of theirs, and J.D. worked with part of the family at the mill. She needs our prayers, and the family needs our prayers. The Owens family and the loss of Miss Shirley, that's Billy Owens' mom and Wayne Owens' wife, and Brother Fred Stallworth. Uh, he's still doing some treatments. Uh, he's doing some at home and, and whatever now, but we need to remember him for his cancer, for God to heal that cancer. He's the pastor of the Marble Community Church now where my sister goes. Uh, anybody else have any other prayer requests? Okay, let's go to God in prayer. Lord, we know that it's a privilege to be able to be here today in your house, but it's a privilege to be able to go to prayer, Lord, and take these needs to you, Lord, in prayer. We know, Lord, that you're always listening. We know that the things that we can't even speak from our hearts or things we have unspoken in our hearts, we know that Jesus takes those things before you and that you consider them. And, Lord, we thank you for that. And we ask you today, Lord, to remember each and every family that we called out, God. Lord, every one of them, God. You know every one. You know every situation. And we just ask you, God, comfort those that have lost loved ones and Lord we ask you to touch these that are sick and for whatever reason God that they need prayer we just ask you to touch them Lord and we pray that you would receive all the glory and Lord we ask all these things according to your will in Jesus name Amen
Think about this. Yeah. Bacon's the best. There's nothing better than bacon, right? And so bacon reminds me that there's also nothing better than a great pack. Hey, buddy, what's going on? Oh, uh, making a pastor appreciation video. You're making a pa- Oh, hey! Tommy and Eddie the Skid Guy's here, and it's that time, pastor appreciation. Yeah. What, I don't, uh, why, why, why the bacon? Oh, why the no, bacon? no, think about this. Yeah? Bacon's the best. There's nothing better than bacon, right? And so bacon reminds me that there's also nothing better than a great pastor, all right? Right? I love that. Okay, well- No, no, it's more. Think about this, like pastors on Sunday morning, sometimes they'll tell a little funny story and they're really hamming it up, you know, hamming it up like bacon. <laughs> yeah. That's really yeah. Also, oh, oh yeah, the bacon bits. Think about this. They're always throwing out these little like spiritual bits, right? That just make life a little tastier, just make a little more savory. Okay. Wow, yeah. you've really thought this through. Totally, totally. Oh, and, and, and they go great with baked potatoes. Who, the pastors or the bacon bits? Yeah. Okay. Well, just as much as we love bacon and who doesn't love bacon, we love our pastors as well. Thank you, pastors, for what you do, how you tend to the flock, how you take care of them, how you shepherd them. We appreciate you so much. So we want to say it all the time, but especially during pastor appreciation, thank you for what you do. Yeah. Also, by the way, if your church is showing you this video, it means they signed you up. <laughs> Get this for... A free year of bacon bits, all you can eat for a year. I don't think that's how it works. No, it's really true. It's a fundraiser my kids are doing. Thank you. We got a new computer lab. Thank you. All right. Well, I actually like bacon. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good to see everybody here today. Hope everybody's had a good week. Amen? Amen. John chapter 14, if you will. John chapter 14. I was asked to, uh, to kind of shorten it a little bit, so all of you saying, yeah, right. Uh, so I'm going to try to shave off a couple of minutes anyway. Amen? <laughs> John chapter 14. Going to be looking at the first uh, six verses today. If you have it, say amen. amen. All right. John chapter 14, Jesus speaking. He says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Jesus continues, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, verse 4, and the way you know. And verse 5, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? And the last verse, verse 6, which is the focus of our, our message in this series, the I Am series, Jesus said to him, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Join me as we pray. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for this day, for all of your precious people, Lord, for especially your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, for you to provide him today to give us insight. Lord, he is our helper. He is the teacher. He is the author of scripture. And Lord, I pray for the anointing, the unction of the Spirit today in teaching and preaching this word, Lord. Lord, I pray that you just help me, enable me, Lord, to do these things. Lord, I'll give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, this is the, the sixth of the seven I am statements that Jesus says concerning himself. Now, very quickly, you remember he said in John chapter 6, he said he was the bread of life. In John chapter 8, he says, I am the light of the world. In John chapter 10, he gave us two. He told us there that he was the door of the sheepfold, and also he was the good shepherd. So we have four up to that point. And then last week, we closed about a month of, uh, of keeping Lazarus in the tomb for, for about that long. Uh, Jesus told us he is the resurrection and the life. So that brings us to number six, and where we see in verse six, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Three important aspects about who Jesus is. 
Now, if you will turn, hold in verse 14 or chapter 14, go back to chapter 13, if you will. Just put a finger there. And then I want you to move forward all the way past 14, past 15, past 16, and go all the way to chapter 17. And hold those kind of like I'm doing now. Does everybody have that? Amen. Now, if you've got an electronic version and you don't have a regular Bible, it's kind of hard. Maybe you can pinch it. I don't know. <laughs> All of this. Now, here, here's what is important. A lot of times in the Scripture, we have uh, a very, of course, economical book. It's economical with its pages and, and what it covers. And a lot of times, like in 1 Corinthians 15, where it's talking about the order of resurrections, you'll have uh, a vast period of time covered in one verse where it speaks about Jesus being the, the first fruits of the first resurrection, and then those that are his at his coming. That's a period of 2,000 years in just one verse. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, that we looked at so much in, uh, in that series with Lazarus, where he said that some that sleep in the dust of the earth, some will arise to everlasting life, and then a comma, and then those that arise to, uh, arise to corruption, a period of 1,000 years. But this period that I'm telling you and ask you to hold here is all in the same night. All in the same night. John chapter 13, John chapter 14, John chapter 15, John chapter 16, and if you include the high priestly prayer of John chapter 17, all of those took place on a Thursday night in the upper room. This is the Passion Week of Christ. The next day Jesus will be hung on the cross for my sins and, and for your sins. Sunday, if you remember, the triumphal entry, people had been trying to, to anoint him and crown him and to declare him the Messiah. And here we are just a few days later, and the next few hours, they will be crying, crucify him, crucify him. So this is a very, very hard week for Jesus. He knows what he's going to do. He knows that that night he's going to be apprehended. He knows he's going to be flogged. He knows he's going to be rejected when Pilate tries to to get the people to, to ask for him instead of Barabbas. He knows he's going to be hung on the cross. He knows that the Father is going to forsake him. And he knows that he's going to die and descend into the lower parts of the earth, into Sheol. He knows all of that, and he has been trying to tell the disciples about that. In chapter 13, which is the beginning of this, this discourse, by the way, there's four major discourses in the Bible, teachings or, or lessons that we would say. The first one you probably know of is the, the Sermon on the Mount, maybe the most famous one, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. The second one is the Kingdom Parables, where Jesus teaches us about the Kingdom of God. You know, the Kingdom of God is, is like a sower sowing seed. The Kingdom of God is like a man that goes through a field and finds a treasure. He sells everything he has to buy the field so he can have the treasure. The Kingdom is like a, a merchant that has a pearl that he sells all he has to get this pearl. That's the second one. The third one is the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, Luke 21, where Jesus tells us about the things that are going to take place at the end of this age. When he says, you shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. He speaks about the one on the rooftop. Don't go in to, to get clothes. If you're in the field, don't go back to the house, but to flee. The things we concern the end of time, the Olivet Discourse, and then this one right here, which is called the Upper Room Discourse in uh, John chapter 14. So these four major discourses, this is a very important one to be grouped in those four. And what's going on here? Jesus in the previous chapter, chapter 13, has told the disciples some very hard things. Things like this, I'm going to leave you. Things like this. There is a betrayer among you. There is also one that's going to, to, to leave. He's going to deny me. So there's a betrayer and there's a denier here among you. And all of you, all of you disciples, you're going to be scattered. The public ministry is over. Jesus is no longer going to be speaking to the public. He's focusing on the twelve. And just prior to this, he's washed their feet. They were so hung on their selves, they wouldn't wash the feet like they normally would be expected. And so Jesus, teaching them a lesson in humility, takes off his outer garment, grabs a basin and a towel, and he washes their feet. They've been thinking about who's the greatest in the kingdom, who's going to sit at his right, who's going to the left. They've been arguing about that and all caught up in themselves. And here Jesus kind of humbles them 
And I'm sure there's a lot of shame as they realize, hey, we're supposed to be washing feet. Here's our Lord, our Master, washing our feet. Amen. And so he's told them these things. You know, they've been shamed because they wouldn't wash feet. The Lord had washed theirs. Their, their leader, their hope, the one that's going to set up the kingdom is going to lead them. One of them that they don't know, nobody really suspected each other. Uh, they all expected themselves, suspected themselves. Is it me? Is it me? Is it me? Nobody really suspected Judas, but the betrayer is there. One is going to stab them, him, rather, Christ, in the back. One of them is going to deny them, Peter, their leader, the one who is the leader among the disciples, not Christ, but, but the disciples' leader, if you will. Not one time, not two times, but three times. And then all of them are going to scatter. They're all going to be like sheep scattered. So, so they're dealing with a lot of stuff. They're perplexed. They're, they're in a sense of turmoil. They're scared. They're frightened. But who has more to lose in this than any of them? Jesus. Now here's the thing about Jesus. They really should be comforting him. Would you agree? And yet, they're all hung up on themselves. They won't even wash feet. And Jesus in his love and his care, knowing that what's going to happen that night, knowing what he's going to have to endure the next day, knowing that he's going to die, he is going to leave this earth. And yet he turns his mind and his love toward them and he comforts them, the disciples. Amazing. That's, that's the love that the Lord has for the disciples. It's the love that he has for me and you as well. And so with that in mind, if you look at verse 1 in chapter 14, go back there with me if you will. You can see perhaps maybe the tension, the sorrow, the apprehension, the fear that's in the minds of the disciples. The one they thought was going to set up the kingdom, he's going to leave. They, they gave him all. They told Jesus, we, we've left everything. We've forsaken everything to follow you. Now there's going to be no kingdom. There's going to be no leader. They're going to kill you, and what are they going to do to us? I mean, they knew and they expected that what they would, did to, what they would do to Jesus would be what they would do to them. And by the way, each one of those disciples would die a martyr's death except for John. And so what they were thinking was really true. You're going to leave us? Who's going to help us? Who's going to give us the questions, give me answers to the questions that we have? Who's going to heal us or touch us whenever we, we're sick? Who's going to do a miracle for us? You're going to leave? And one of us is going to stab you in the back, and another one of us is going to deny you? Can't believe that, and we're all going to be scattered? And Jesus addresses that, and he says in verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. Now, why did he say that? Because they had troubled hearts, right? When Paul says, you know, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning these things. Why, why did he say that? Because they were ignorant, right? And Jesus, seeing these guys, these disciples that have been with him 24-7 for three years, now faced with all these perplexities, all this misunderstanding, all this fear, he realizes their hearts are troubled because, as John 2 would tell us, he knew what was inside of every man. And so he tells them, knowing they had troubled hearts, do not let your hearts be troubled. And so this message really just has three points, but the title of it is, The Keys to Not Having a Troubled Heart. And it's just really three things that we're going to be dealing with here. They're going to be kind of similar, so you'll be able to remember them. Amen? All right, the first one is, and I'm going to take them one by one, but the first one is, how do we have an untroubled heart? What are the keys not to have a troubled heart? The first one is, who you know. The second one is where you'll go. And the third one is what you will be shown. Amen? Amen? All right, so hopefully you can remember those things. The first one, let's go back and address it, if you will, with me. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus had never told the disciples, he's never told us in his word, that we won't have a troubled life. But he does tell us that we don't have to have a troubled heart. In this world, you will have tribulations, Jesus tells us. And in our world, we have a lot of tribulation. We have a lot of trouble. And there's much to be troubled about. We can see that they had a lot to be troubled about. You've got a lot to be troubled about as well. Some of us have health concerns that trouble us. Some of us have relational concerns that trouble us. Some of us have problems in, in the marriage or in the home or, or perhaps with a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a fiance. There's, there's troubles there. And so we have a lot to be troubled about. We, we got troubles, you know, in our, in our schools. We have troubles at the workplace. We've got troubles in the community. 
we got troubles in our nation, in our country, and then you turn on social media, and man, you really want to be troubled. Let that, let that lay on you a little bit, right? Dealing with everybody else's trouble. And so he's not telling them you're not going to have troubles, but what he says is in the midst of your troubles, don't have a troubled heart. Amen. And here's the key. Notice he says the first word, let not. This is an imperative. This is a command. Meaning what? You have a choice. What are you saying, Rick? Your emotions are up to you. They are under your control. Amen. If it were not so, then Jesus would be telling us something to do that we can't do. Are you following me? Yes, this is a choice. And it really is, is like this. He says, stop. If you look at the language, if you look at the way it all is constructed, he's like stay, saying to them, stop being troubled. Stop having a troubled heart. It's up to you. Again. Amen. Again. You say, well, I just don't know about that. Well, Jesus will never give you a command. He will never tell us something to do unless he knows it's something that can be done. And so our emotions are under our control. And so we have a choice. We can either be troubled in a troubled world or we can abide by the words of Christ and not be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. I don't know about you, but I believe the better way in which we live is to follow his words and not be troubled, not have a troubled heart. Well, how do we do that? Well, here again, the three keys. The first one is who you know. He tells us this, you believe in God, believe also in me. Now, what is he telling the disciples there? These disciples, they of course believed in the God of the Old Testament, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Now, again, he's referring to God the Father, because the two are put together. You believe in God, also believe in me. Now, the way this is put together is kind of is kind of a little bit confusing. You know, is he talking about an imperative here? Is he talking about an indicative? And the answer is yes. He's actually probably talking about both. I mean, you, you have believed in God, and you have believed in me. And then the, the other part of that is continue to believe in God. Continue to believe in me. Amen. Now, the God in which he's speaking of, there is God the Father, which they have not seen. No one has seen God. Remember, Moses wanted to see God. That's the thing in which, you know, has always been held back from, from people, Old Testament and New, because he told Moses, no man can see me and live, but I'll hide you in the cleft of the, of the rock, and, and you can see my afterglow. You can see me after I pass by. And so he's telling these disciples here, you believe in God, the God that you cannot see, and you believe in me, the one that you have seen. But here's the thing. I'm going to be taken from you, and I'm no longer going to be able to be seen. And you're going to have to continue to believe in me. So here's the correlation. You believe in a God that you have not seen and cannot see. You, right now, can see me. But in a moment, in a, in a day, you're not going to see me. You need to still continue to believe in me, the one that you cannot see. And that's really how we have to believe, too, as well. Now, the psalmist in Psalm 27, you don't have to turn there, but let me read this to you. David understood this. David in Psalm 27 was up under a lot of hard, difficult times. Enemies, people were trying to wipe him out, destroy him, take over the throne, take it away from him. And David would say in verse 13 of Psalm 27, he said, I would have lost heart unless. In other words, these things that I'm dealing with, David would say, they would have overtaken me. They'd have put me down and kept me down unless, which is what? I mean, there's something that enabled him to stand, something that kept him from being put down and trampled on and destroyed. What does he say? I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the Lord. No, that's not what he says. The goodness of the Lord. Are you all with me this morning? Amen. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. See, he's not expecting to see God in the land of the living, but he's expecting to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Big, big difference. Amen? Amen. Now, how do we believe? Well, the Bible tells us, well, I lost my note there. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter uh, 1 and verse 8, he says this concerning you and me. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory. Amen. Although you can't see God, none of us can, 
we have what we have a, a an idea of what God is like, although we can't see Him. In coming times in the future, when we get these uh, new bodies that the Lord is going to allow us to have and give us, grant us to have, we will be able to see the Lord in His glory. We'll be able to to be there in the midst of the Lord. We're going to look at it in just a little bit. But we can't now, so we have to believe in one that we can't see, right? We're not like the apostles or the disciples that had that experience three years with Jesus. We believe in a Messiah. We believe in a Savior. We believe in a Lord that we have never seen. Amen? Amen? Amen. None of us have ever seen the Lord. And so we have to believe in one that we have not seen. And believing in that, our belief is so strong that it enables you and me. It causes us to have an inexpressible joy. A joy that is full of glory for the expectation when we will get to see Him. Amen? Amen. And so coming back to verse 1 in chapter 14, when he tells us this here about, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. You're not going to be able to see me in a little while. But just like you believed in God the Father, who you have not seen, you're going to have to continue to believe in me, who you have seen, but are not going to be able to see. Continue to believe in in me. Amen. 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 So it's who you know. It's who you know. Amen. How do you have an untroubled heart? It's who you know. You know Jesus. Amen. And the psalmist said, I have not seen him, but I believe in him, and my belief gives me the ability to uh, ascend past these troubles, this difficult time in my life, and to have an inexpressible joy and full of glory. Amen. Amen. All right, the second thing is where you'll go. Where you'll go. Look what he says in verse 2. In my father's house, there are what? Many mansions. Does everybody see that? Amen? Amen? And if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Amen. Where are we going? Where is this place called the father's house? Amen. Well, it's heaven, right? That's right. Amen. So not only is there one that you know, God, and his son, Jesus, whom you can't see, but yet you can have uh, inexpressible joy, full of glory. There is a hope for heaven in my Father's house. Now, the Bible many times speaks about heaven in, uh, in different terms. It speaks about heaven like a country because of its vastness. It speaks about heaven like a city because of its inhabitants. Many times it'll speak about heaven as a paradise because of its beauty. Here it speaks about heaven as a house because of its, what? Family. Family. And he says this, in my Father's house are many mansions. Now, thinking about mansions, we get that, it's kind of an unfortunate, or unfortunate rather, translation from the, from the Latin Vulgate. It really means, it's the word mone, M-O-N-E, it really means a dwelling place, a dwelling place. You see, if we go back into the ancient Jewish culture, when a, a patriarch or a father would have in those times a tent, you know, Abraham had a tent, Isaac had a tent, Jacob had a tent, they were nomadic people. But whenever one of their sons would grow up and get married, you know what they would do? They wouldn't go and build them a, a brand new tent somewhere down you know, in the, in the desert they would actually add on to the tent of the father. Amen. And so that tent would be expanded, but it was still one tent. They would separate it just by like a sheet. Right. And so as each one of the, the sons would get married, guess what? They'd add another compartment onto it, like a little apartment. And you're saying, oh, no, don't tell me I've got to live in an apartment in heaven. Okay? But the father's house is not like, a, it's not like we may think of, uh, well, Savannah and Brett, you know, they went to the Biltmore estate, you know, which, anybody been, been to the Biltmore before? You know that vast thing built by the Vanderbilts, I believe, right? Amazing, amazing, amazing place, you know. Uh, Stephanie, not too long ago, talked me into watching uh, Downton Abbey. And uh, we, I think we're now in season three or four. If you've seen that place, you know, and I used to make fun of her, I don't want to watch Downtown Abbey. It's not downtown, it's Downton. <laughs> You know, and they got this huge, huge thing with all these servants, you know. And you may think about that like being a mansion, whether it's the Biltmore Mansion or Estate or whether it's Downton. Or you may think of it like kind of like Hollywood where there's a long boulevard, you know, with really nice 
uh, beautiful streets and sidewalks and manicured lawns and houses and, and, you know, and statues and all those things. And you're thinking, you know, that's what heaven's going to be like. You know, the statues may be of you, you know, going down the road. And you'll have this big place. And, and I'm going to need a map for heaven. So I need to know where things are. And sometimes we may think about that, but you won't need a map for heaven because all you see these dwelling places are part of, guess what? The Father's house. The Father's house just keeps expanding and expanding and expanding and expanding and expanding. And you say, well, I don't know if they can make a tent that big. Well, hey, I had a friend that stopped by the office this week and went to the Barrett-Jackson uh, auto uh, things that they do, the, the auction that they have. Dad, you know what I'm talking about. They, they auction off all these exotic cars, these classic cars, these muscle cars. You know, all these things like that, run like 600 of them through a day. And he went there, and it was like some type of big civic center there. But he said that when they go to an open place, they erect one tent 16 acres big. 16 acres. Not, not a bunch of them. One tent, 16 acres. And you say, wow, I don't know if that's, that's a big tent. Amen? Amen? So they bring in a bunch of crews. They bring in a bunch of equipment. They pick up this tent. And now if man can erect a 16-acre tent, here on this earth, think about what God can do in heaven. He can continue to expand and expand and expand. You won't need a map because we're all located in the Father's house. Sometimes we get this idea that, oh, if I don't, if I don't do good, I'm just going to have me a little, you know, a pine board shack, you know, on the other side of the tracks in heaven, you know, just kind of a lean to there, all kind of ruddy and stuff like that. No, it's all part of the Father's house. In my Father's house are many mansions. Think about this, many Many times we put the focus on the mansions, and yet we, we forget to think about the fact that there's many there, which is what? Many more than one. There are many mansions, and they are there for who? For you. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And so we're talking about heaven. We're, we're concerned about that, and we want to go there, but what do we actually know about heaven? You don't want to be, by the way, you don't want to be that person that gets to heaven, and you say, oh, what's that? What's that? Oh, that's the throne. You, oh, yeah. I was supposed to read about that, but I just got the Cliff Notes versions of it, you know. You don't want to be surprised when you get to heaven and say, what is that? What is that? You want to know what those things are. Amen? Now, let me show you a few things about heaven in, in uh, Revelation chapter 21, if you will turn there. This is a place that we're going. It would help us if we knew a little bit about it. Amen? Amen. Now, by the way, you probably know if you especially if you've been in Bible study, that, that when the tribulation period happens, which is going to be after the rapture of the church, when the church is taken away, there's going to be seven years of tribulation on this earth. That's going to be followed, Revelation 19, by the coming of Christ. We see in the second coming, when he comes riding on that white horse and destroying the enemies that try to wipe out Israel. And then the millennium, which is a word that means thousand years, merely thousand and um, years, a thousand years where Christ, Jesus, is going to rule on this earth. Everybody with me this morning, amen? A thousand years of righteous rule where Jesus is going to rule and reign. The world is going to be turned into a place much like the Garden of Eden. Man's lifespan is going to be extended. Somebody dies at 100 years old is going to be considered to have died prematurely as a child. The animal kingdom is going to go back to eating vegetables, you know, straw. That type of a diet. No, no more any carnivorous types of animals there. Dangerous, poisonous animals. Children are going to be playing with those poisonous snakes. They're going to be leading around these dangerous animals that we consider dangerous today. In those times, they won't be like that. There's going to be no satanic influence because Satan and his minions are going to be bound in the Abuso for a thousand years. And so there's going to be that thousand year reign of Christ where, where people are living under righteous rule. And after that time, after the millennial period, comes to a close, the heaven and the earth are going to be destroyed. You guys already know that, right? Okay. Uh, Peter tells us about that. Peter tells us that Christ is the one holding all these things together. The science can't figure out how in the world an atom can, can stay together when you've got two uh, light charges inside of it when they normally should repel and they can't figure it out. You know, they call it the atomic glue. It, it's not atomic glue, by the way. Okay. It's Christ. Colossians tells us it's by him, Jesus, all things exist and continue. He holds all things together. Whenever that time comes, whenever the heaven and earth are going to be destroyed, he just simply lets it go. And you've got the ultimate atomic separation there. Amen. Amen. And so we pick up in chapter 21, 
After those things have taken place in verse 21, John says this, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. That's what Peter tells us in his epistle there, that the earth is going to be burned up with a fervent heat. Also, there was no more sea. Now, I'm going to go through this, and we're going to go through a few verses that speak about heaven. I'm going to give you some, some little key words to think about what heaven is going to be like, okay? Yes, amen. amen. Verse 2, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, or as I like to refer to it, it's the new J, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Heaven, the new J, is going to be a place that's prepared, a prepared place, amen? It's a place prepared for you and me. Verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Heaven is a God place. Amen? In verse 4, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. Heaven that we're going to, the Father's house, is going to be a happy place. Can you say amen to that? Verse 5. Then he sat on the throne and said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. Heaven is going to be a new place as well. Amen. All things are going to be brand new. Verse 6, and he said to me, it is done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. Heaven is going to be a satisfying place. Can you say amen? I hope you're not getting bored with the idea of heaven coming up. Amen? amen. All right. Don't worry about people going in and out. We're trying to get ready for, for, uh, for the dinner, so people are going to be coming in and out, so don't get distracted by that. Amen? Stay focused on the word if you can. Verse 7, he who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. He said he shall inherit what? All things. Heaven is going to be a plentiful place. Can you say amen to that? Verse 8, But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire. This is the, the lake of fire that we're uh, so familiar with. And brimstone, which is the second death. Heaven is going to be a safe place. There's not going to be murderers there idolaters there, adulterers there, liars there, people working in witchcraft, none of those things. They're all going to be in the lake of fire. Heaven's going to be a safe place. Amen. Amen. Verse 9, Then one of the seven angels who had come, uh, excuse me, had the seven bowls filled with the seven last place came to me and talked with me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Heaven is going to be a relational place. There's no closer relationship in human existence than that of a husband and a wife or the two shall become one flesh. Amen? Amen? Heaven's going to be a relational place. Verse 10, And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain, and he showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. What a wonderful place. Heaven is going to be a wonderful, wonderful place. Verse 11, Having the glory of God, her light was like the most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Heaven will be a glorious place. Amen. This is your father's house we're talking about. Also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and the names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Speaking about the Old Testament there. So each one of these gates, and he tells us in verse 11, three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three on the south, three on the west. Okay, you've got four sides of this, this city called the New Jerusalem, heaven that we're talking about. And it's got 12 gates, three on each side. Three times four is... Exactly, 12, right? Yes. Amen. Okay, y'all with me this morning? Okay. See a couple of smile. Each one of those is going to be a name. Each gate is going to be the name of one of the 12 tribes, speaking about the Old Testament, okay? But guess what? We're not left out either. Now, the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the name of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So what are we talking about? New Testament. So you've got the 12 gates, which speak about the Old Testament, each one of the 12 tribes of Israel, and you've got, guess what, the 12 walls built on foundations that speak about the apostles, the New Testament, the church. And so you see no one is left out. No Old Testament saints are left out. No New Testament believers are left out. All are included here. Heaven is a complete place. Amen? 
In verse 15, and he who talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and its gates and its walls. And so John is there probably thinking about how big is this place? How big is the new jade? The city is laid out like a square, its length as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with a rod, 12,000 furlongs its length. Breadth and height are equal. So this is a place that we may not be that familiar with, but heaven is going to be like a cube. It's 12,000 furlongs wide, it's 12,000 furlongs deep, and it's 12,000 furlongs high. Exactly. You guys are paying attention. How long is a furlong? I don't even know how long a furlong is. Well, a furlong is as long as it is a fur. A fur and a long, right? <laughs> Amen? Well, that don't help me any. Okay. 12,000 furlongs is equal to 1,500 miles. 1,500 miles. So we've got a city that's coming down from heaven, okay? And by the way, it never mentions that it comes and lands on the earth, so it's suspended somehow between heaven and earth, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. After the old heaven had been destroyed, after the old earth had been burned up, consumed, there's a new heaven, a new earth, and the new city, the capital city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven. And how big is it? It's 1,500 miles wide. It's 1,500 miles deep. And guess what? As a cube, it's 1,500 miles tall. Well, how, don't tell me anything, Rick. I don't know about that. Well, let me, let me see if I can tell you something about that. That is 2.25 million square feet. Okay? The capital city, New J. Uh, it is 15,000 times as big as London. 15,000 times as big as London. Uh, it is about, if you can put, get this in your mind, how big is it? It's about the size of our moon. But yet it's cubed. Okay, so has everybody got an idea about how big this is? Okay, all right. So now, this is the Father's house we're talking about. This is a new J coming down from heaven. This is what we would speak about where we're talking about heaven, where we're going to spend eternity. This is it right here. Well, I don't know if that's enough room for me. I, you know, the moon is kind of big, but it's not really that big. Well, if you're worried about that, a guy by the name of Henry Morris done some projections on this. He said that if you just took quarter of the of the size of this place is 2.25 million square feet if you just took a quarter of it and designate that for people and the rest of it designated for like recreation and and, and woods and and uh, gardens and things like that 75 percent of it dedicated for all those things only 25 percent dedicated for people you know how many people it could hold 20 billion people 20 billion people there's around getting close to around 8 billion today are y'all still with me? Yes, okay. All right. Now, each person out of that 20 billion people, and hopefully that's one of you, amen, amen. will be given a place, a cubicle block, 75 acres cubed. Is that big enough for you? Okay. Skip saying, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So this is heaven. This is heaven. And so when we get to a place where we feel like, you know, Man, my heart is troubled. I got to remember who it is that I know. I got to remember I know Jesus. And I got to remember where I'm going to be going. I'm going to be going to heaven. Amen. And so if you'll realize that, these truths about where it is that you're going and who it is that you'll know, hopefully that can, that can ease your troubled heart. And that's what Jesus lets these disciples know. In the Father's house, there are many dwelling places. Meaning what? There is one for you. There's one for you. There's many there. There's many there. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, come back, if you will, to John chapter 14. He says, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Two times in verse 12, excuse me, 2 and 3, he speaks about preparing a place. I go to prepare a place for you. And we read in 21 how that heaven is a prepared place. It's a prepared as a bride for a husband. Now, you that are parents or grandparents or maybe expecting to be parents, uh, those of us that have had children, whenever we realize, you know, that we are expecting, what's this one thing that we do? We, we go and we prepare a nursery, Amen. right? We, we go and we, we change a wallpaper or we put up some new paint. We've got to put together a, a crib, right? We've got to get all the nice mattresses and the sheets that match, you know. We've got to get some furry little teddy bears and things like that. We got to get those things with different textures because you know the science, the psychologists they tell us you know the babies need all those different textures you know to be able to feel with their fingers and put on their face so they can grow and, and we got to get a, a camera right a baby camera so we can see what's going on and say hello to them you know whenever they're sound asleep right we got to get the little wedge pillow we got to get all these things got to get a rocking chair you know or a glider correct 
What are we doing? We are preparing a place for one who is coming. Why? Because we love them. We love this little child that hasn't come yet. Here's the thing that you need to understand. We prepare for those that we love. Or we could take that and turn it the other way. Love prepares for those who are loved. And Jesus loves me. And Jesus loves you. And so what does he do? Just like we as, as earthly people will prepare a place for someone that we love, someone that we care about, guess what? Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. You want to know why I'm leaving? I'm going to prepare a place for you. Why? Because love prepares for those who are loved. And what was Jesus' occupation before he became a minister of the gospel? That's right, a carpenter, right? And carpenters do what? They build things, amen? And so he's had, what, around two thousand years to be building a place for you and me amen? amen he's preparing a place for us he's going to come again and receive us to herself where i go you know and and the way you know verse four now you got to love verse five because here we have thomas thomas said to him lord we don't know that where you're going and how can we know the way sometimes you may be a little apprehensive whenever someone tells you something that you don't you don't know about and you may say, I don't want to seem dumb, so I'm not going to say anything. Did you understand what they're saying? No, I didn't understand what they're saying, but I don't want to, I don't want to bring attention to myself. I'm glad we've got people like Thomas, okay? Because Thomas doesn't care. He don't care. I don't care about looking dumb. You know, Jesus said, you know the way. He said, no, no, we don't know the way. We don't know where you're going. Amen. Aren't you glad for Thomas? Amen. Thomas is one, you know, he's a, he got a question mark for a brain, you know. I, I want to know. And so that leads us, we're so grateful for that because it leads us into the six I am statement where Jesus says these things. He said to him, I am the way. We don't know the way. Jesus said, I am the way. Amen. Take, take a, a trip back with me in the past to, to pre-cell phone days. And you're looking for a place, okay? And you know, in those times when you didn't have those things, you had to stop and ask somebody if you didn't know where you was going. Right? Amen. And you stop and you say, hey, you know, can you tell me where the can you tell me where the Krispy Kreme is, you know, in this place? Oh yeah, I can tell you that. You say, go down there to that juniper tree, not the pine tree, not the oak tree, but the juniper tree. And you know, there's gonna be a four-way stop, but about, you know, a couple of hundred feet on this side, there's a little dirt path to your right. There's also one to your left. There's also one that makes a circle around. Don't take either one of those, take the one to the right. And go down that till you see the old stump. Not the new stumps that are there, because he's been logging, but the old stump there. And when you see the old stump, then you got about another, about another five minutes of travel, and then you're going to come to a four-way stop. When you come to that four-way stop, just go right on through it. Don't even stop. Just go right on through it. And you go on down that, you'll see the first, second, third red light and a caution light, and then one more red light. Take that red light after the caution light, after the first three red lights, and then you'll look hard to your right, and on the service road on the left, you'll see the Krispy Kreme. Now, to get in that service road, you've got to get in the far left turn lane, not the one in the middle, not the one on the right, but the far left. If you get in that one, if you don't get in those other two, you'll miss it. You've got to come all the way back around. <laughs> now, what are you going to do if you can't remember all that? You're going to not find it, right? You're going to be lost. Well, how much better would it be if the person says, you know what? It would be better not if I tell you the way, but if I show you oh, the way. God, I had a guy that come by the office a couple of weeks ago, and he said, I was trying to find you, couldn't find you. Now, by the way, you know, GPS doesn't work right here. Uh, it, it'll take you to different places for whatever reason. So you can't even in our day depend on modern electronics. Amen? He said, I went all the way up there to a place on the other side of McDonald's, and I went in there and said, hey, do you know where I can find this guy? Uh, yeah, yeah. Better yet, I'll take you there. I'll pull into the driveway and show you there where he's at. And he said, that guy did. This guy was from out of town. He said, I'll take you there. I'm not going to just tell you. I'm just going to take you there. So that's what he did. He drove all the way down to our place, brought him into the, into the driveway, and he left. And the guy said, you know, he didn't tell me the way. He showed me the way. Amen. Well, what's better, somebody to tell you the way or for somebody to show you the way? Absolutely, somebody to show you the way. And what Jesus is saying about this, he says, look, I'm not telling you the way. I am the way. And what you've got to love about this and what kind of, uh, often said about us as believers that we are closed-minded, that you're so exclusive. But I'm not closed-minded. Well, I guess I am closed-minded because Christ closed my mind. He showed me the way and then He closed my mind. And if you're a follower of Him, He's done the same thing for you, hopefully. Amen? He doesn't tell us there's, there's ten ways. He doesn't tell us there's five. He doesn't even tell us, J.B., there's two. He says, I am the way. The way. Which means what? 
There's only one way. There's only one way. To what? To Father's house. There's not two ways, because if it's two ways, you might get confused. There's five ways. No, no, no. There, there's not, the, you know, the way of Confucianism. You know, it's not following him. It's not the, the, the Iranian belief of Zoroaster. No, it's not that. It's not Hinduism. It's not Mohammedism. It's none of those things. It's not even works, you know. You can't work, and so many people, I'm afraid, are, are bent on the unbelief, a lie from Satan that if I just do enough good things, if I'm not a bad person, if I don't kill anybody, if I don't rape anybody, if I don't end up in prison, then God will let me in. That's a works-based religion. That's not going to get you into heaven. Well, what if my parents are Christians? I'm sorry. What if your sister is? Sorry. It's something that you have to do on your own. There is one way, and Jesus says he is the way. Now, if Jesus would have said there's five ways, we wouldn't be exclusive. And I would tell you there's five ways. But there's only one, Amen. and that's Christ. So if you want to get to heaven, please hear me today. If you want to end up in heaven, there's only one way. And it is Christ. He is the way. And if they want to call us exclusive, well, so be it. But in the end, you see, you'll find out that he is not only the way, but he is the truth. Amen. He's the truth. So many are looking for truth today. Pilate asked Jesus, what is the truth? There he was talking to the one who is truth. And he's the light. He's the light. Notice that Jesus doesn't say these things about himself. He doesn't say that, that I'm going to show you the way I am the way. He doesn't say, I'm going to tell you about the truth. I am the truth. Amen. And he doesn't say, I'm going to give you the secrets of life. He says, I am the life. Amen. And so today there may be some that are here and they say, you know what, Rick, I, I, I really I feel kind of like I'm wandering. Not wandering, but wandering with an O. Just kind of wandering around. I don't know which way to go. Jesus was said, I am the way. Some will say, I just don't know what to think anymore. Jesus says, I tell you what to think. I, I am the truth. Think on me. And there'll be others saying, you know what? I, I don't know how I'm going to make it anymore. I'm about ready to give up. Jesus says, don't do that. Don't give up. Turn to me. I am the light. I am the light. You see, without the way, you don't know where to go. Without the truth, you don't know what to know. Amen. And without the life, you don't know how to live. Amen. And so Jesus encompasses all of those things. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. Amen. And to add to that exclusivity there, he says, no one comes to the Father but by me. Amen. There's not going to be any exclusions. You may be a good guy. You may be a good a good girl, you may excel, you may be a philanthropist, you may excel in the ways of being good like nobody ever has in this world and nobody's ever surpassed you. But Jesus said, no one comes to the Father but by me. Amen. That's the only way, God. Amen. That's the only way. Jesus is the only way. And so for me and you, this message today, this passage of Scripture, I hope, I hope it bears into your heart, to your soul. Because this period of time that we have on this earth, you know, that we may think, well, man, I got plenty of time, I'm young. You know, I got plenty of time, I'm, I'm halfway there. You may say, I got plenty of time, you know, people will live another 20, 30 years past where I'm at now. Well, yeah, that's, that's great, that's awesome. You know, if you live to be 70, 80, 90, 100, that'd be awesome, great. But you know, the Bible speaks about that being like a vapor. That our life, these 70, 80, 90, 100 years, is like a vapor. 